corrosive. Catastrophic. People feel there's no hope. And often covert. <laughs> That's one bloody monopoly money. Corruption costs the world nearly three trillion dollars every year and blights the lives of hundreds of millions. But in some parts of the world, there's a renewed drive to disrupt corruption. We need to act with urgency and purpose to restore our state-owned enterprises. From bold moves at the top, We've got to make sure that there's strong, committed, ethical leadership. To new technologies, shining a light on the problem. Now in Ukraine, we have the most transparent corruption in the world. Communities, companies and countries are learning lessons in how to root out corruption. Our country changed to one of the obvious technological leaders. Hold the guilty to account. This is one of the largest cases the SFO had worked on and challenge the culture that allows it to continue. Do we accept the way it is, or do you stand up for something? <laughs> this is a notoriously violent and lawless district of Cape Town in South Africa. Here in Cape Flats, there were almost a 1,000 murders in the first six months of 2019. And police corruption is helping to fuel this violence. Our cardo is a year old here, so we decided to give him a little party. He grew up in the community as a teenager. He got married. One kid, and then in 2015 he was murdered. Avril Andrews says both she and the police know the identity of the killer who shot her son, Alcado, dead. But Avril believes police corruption has stalled her search for justice. Corruption affects our community very much. I've experienced it myself in police, even with the recent case. One of the guys tried to intimidate my family. Our community is going down. You know, people feel there's no hope. Since her son's death, Avril has spoken out publicly at great personal risk against the corrupt forces undermining the rule of law in her community. Alcardo, this is the fourth year that we are seeking justice there are certain things that you've discussed with me that you would have loved to do in the community, so I'm doing it for you. I believe we're going to get justice. In South Africa, the police are known to supply weapons to gangs. In 2016, a former police colonel pleaded guilty to illegally selling 2,400 guns. Most ended up in Cape Flats, where nearly 2,500 shootings have been linked to illegal guns since 2010, including 261 child victims. Within the South African police, anti-corruption campaigners have documented over 475 reports of bribery and over 300 reports of abuses of power. Avril has founded a support group for bereaved mothers, campaigning for justice in the face of this corruption. Thank you, ladies, for being here. In the past six years, 229 dockets, records of court proceedings, are reported to have gone missing in Western Cape. Leslie Weingard, whose son was also murdered in Cape Flats, says the files related to his case mysteriously disappeared from the courthouse. Prosecutor told me, but I had the file, I had the file. So somebody sneaked that file out of his office and made it disappear. In South Africa, the rot of corruption runs deep. 
This secretly recorded footage captured a successful businessman, Gavin Watson, seemingly organizing to pay bribes to government officials. The Watson, who died in 2019, was a hero of the anti-apartheid struggle and had close links to the ANC party, which has been in power for 25 years. <laughs> That's one bloody monopoly money. <laughs> yes, sir. During the nine-year presidency of Jacob Zuma, this corruption captured the state, right up to the very top. He and his cronies plundered state-owned enterprises. In Zuma's second term alone, about 100 billion US dollars was stolen, just short of a third of South Africa's GDP. But South Africans demanded change. And in 2019, they elected a new president on an explicit platform to crack down on corruption. Cyril Ramaphosa has set out to provide the clean leadership that is vital in any fight against corruption. We need to act with urgency and purpose to restore our state-owned enterprises. Those who monitor the excesses of the Zuma years are hopeful his successor will drive change from the top. Corruption Watch has been in existence for eight years now, mostly during the Zuma administration, and working with the two administrations is like night and day. We now encounter an administration that is much more willing to work with the likes of us doesn't mean that we don't have to be vigilant in holding them to account, but it is, there's definitely a new spirit afoot in the country, although still huge problems to overcome. The new leadership has already begun to make its mark. I think it's achieved a fair amount in the period since Ramaphosa was installed as president key Zuma acolytes who were leaders of critical institutions have been fired, others put in their place, state-owned enterprise boards have been uh, revamped. But fighting corruption on this scale demands more than just political leadership. Commission Chairperson, Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo announced yesterday key appointments to his commission. In 2018, Judge Raymond Zondo was appointed to head an unprecedented commission of inquiry into how corruption captured the state under the Zuma administration. We want to have an idea about the levels of corruption in the country and what forms corruption takes so that we can make recommendations as to what um, the country should do. Uh, to try and uh, bring it up to the absolute minimum levels of corruption. The Commission has heard thousands of hours of testimony from over a hundred witnesses to fraud and corruption. Zondo's warts and all approach to exposing the problem has been compared to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission after the apartheid era. Above all, it educates the public, it places before the public exactly what happened during the Zuma administration, which, as you can imagine, was subject to a lot of false news and factual manipulation. With the truth now emerging, there's also a fresh push for justice. A new chief public prosecutor has promised to clean up the National Prosecuting Authority, another institution infiltrated by Zuma's cronies. Ah, right, OK, good. Shamila Batoyi is a respected former lawyer from the International Criminal Court in The Hague and President Ramaphosa's most significant appointment to date. People know that it's not business as usual. 
If we want to be serious about addressing corruptions, we've got to make sure that there's strong, committed, ethical leadership. In Shamila Batoy's new job, that means getting serious about enforcement. We've got to look at prosecuting the right people. That is where I think in the past, the prosecution, the NPA lost credibility. They failed to demonstrate that they were serious about tackling corruption. And that is not just within the NPA, but certainly within the broader law enforcement uh, space. This kind of leadership may start to convince South Africans that rhetoric has finally turned into action. So I know that the, the people of South Africa are impatient, understandably so, they have every reason. What is the greatest deterrent to crime? The certainty that there will be an investigation, that there will be a prosecution and there will be consequences. And the sad reality is that in South Africa, that wasn't the case in the recent past. While clean leadership is vital to tackling corruption, so is having the ability to spot it. In Ukraine, another country with a deep history of corruption, the struggle for greater financial transparency has been hard fought. In 2014, a violent revolution deposed its notoriously corrupt president, Viktor Yanukovych. During four years in office, he and his associates stole an estimated 40 billion US dollars from the public purse. Activists who helped to depose Yanukovych have since traced the flows of this stolen money and helped to reveal the extent of his corruption. One of them is Max Nefudov. So we're in Mizhigiria, the infamous mansion uh, that belonged to ex-president Yanukovych. Yanukovych earned an official salary of about 100,000 US dollars a year. But he used the proceeds of corruption to build this lavish palace on 345 acres of land outside the capital, Kiev. This is a huge territory with big houses and golf courses and boxing rings and restaurants and his personal zoo with ostriches. It's a nice one. He has nice eyebrows. Kickbacks and bribes from government contracts were one of the principal ways of stealing money from the state. Two billion dollars a year used to be lost through government officials paying over the odds for anything from building materials to medicines. One of the reasons why those in power could afford little luxuries, such as a gold-paneled chapel, limited edition John Lennon Steinway piano, and even toilet brushes encrusted with Swarovski crystals. Everything here was built obviously using money siphoned from the budget. So basically, all this is like a museum to the corruption. This kleptocracy was catastrophic for Ukrainians, denying them affordable health care and good public services. After Yanukovych was deposed, Max and other activists set about changing the system that had allowed corruption to flourish. They determined that one thing in particular would be vital to transform Ukraine. Transparency. Specifically, the ability to trace and track the flows of public money. The beauty of the system is that uh, this is just sort of like a website with explanations and open data. This online system made the bidding process for government contracts more transparent. Now, whenever government officials want to buy something, they must put out a tender on a single platform, accessible to anyone. These are the ongoing tenders of the Kyiv region. There are just over 10,000 ongoing tenders right now, worth 1.8 billion euro. And these are the statuses of procedures and so on and so on. Roughly a million tenders go through the system each year. 
and the system must openly log every bid for every government contract. As a combination of uh, better usability, uh, compulsory auctions uh, and uh, different mechanisms to fight collusion and price fixing and different types of fraud, we're able to save uh, about 7 to 8 percent of uh, the value of each tender. It's estimated that the system known as ProZoro has contributed to reducing the cost of corruption to Ukraine by 6 billion US dollars per year since 2014 and the system is now being used in other countries. I'm actually proud that our country changed its positioning from being one of the worst places for public procurement in the world to one of the obvious technological leaders and pioneers in this area. But whilst greater transparency has helped Ukraine to discover and expose corruption, the country still lacks a vital tool to tackle it effective enforcement authorities to hold the guilty parties accountable. More than 11 million documents. They reveal what's alleged to be a global network of tax avoidance, evasion and money laundering. When the most ruthless of the Mexican drug cartels wanted to hide their money, they went to HSBC. In today's globalized world, Enforcement agencies in wealthy countries face a challenge to root out corruption and deliver justice. And they're increasingly deploying new technologies to help. So the investigation covered three decades uh, across three business sectors uh, and seven different jurisdictions. This was one of the largest cases the SFO had worked on. In 2013, the Serious Fraud Office in London began investigating systematic bribery by one of Britain's most prestigious companies, Rolls-Royce. Five years into their investigation, the SFO had gathered 30 million documents and needed to determine which could be used to prosecute the firm. We started reviewing it using the, the old method, which was just to use keyword searches and then instruct independent barristers to review that material. And we needed to find a way to speed that up. Advances in technology meant that um, AI and machine learning based products became available that could help with this work. In the first use of AI in a British criminal case, the system was able to search documents 2,000 times faster than human lawyers and more reliably. And what this tool does is looks for patterns within the documents, patterns in communication. And what we were able to find was the results were more consistent. And that's not to say that the lawyers were making mistakes, but the reality is if you have five different lawyers, they will make different determinations. In court, Rolls-Royce admitted that in six countries across the world, middlemen had paid tens of millions of dollars in bribes in order to secure contracts for the company. Aware that the punishment faced by Rolls-Royce could act as a useful deterrent to other companies, the British authorities ordered the firm to pay a record fine of around $650 million in return for avoiding prosecution. Critics say that individual prosecutions, rather than just a huge fine, would act as a clearer deterrent to future wrongdoing. But the Serious Fraud Office insists that money talks. A settlement of this size will absolutely act as a disincentive against corruption, particularly in a case like Roald Royce, where not only does it have that financial impact immediately, but there are certain conditions which they must meet in terms of their systems and processes and how they have to operate in the future to demonstrate to, to the court uh, that they are not uh, continuing with this sort of behavior. Rolls-Royce says it has made a raft of changes, strengthening its compliance and oversight procedures and introducing new technology. We now have an app, a code of conduct app, rather than a written document. That means that everybody on their iPhone has access to support, both in respect of the policies and the processes, but know who to speak to if they need help. The company insists its actions have brought about a culture change, which will make corrupt behavior less likely in the future. 
I can tell you that the exercise we have been through at Rolls-Royce has not been box ticking. We provided super cooperation in respect of fixing the past issues. We have taken incredibly seriously and frankly spent a lot of money dealing with both the past and trying to set up the framework for the future. But none of this would have happened had Rolls-Royce not been caught. All too often, companies' efforts to educate staff about avoiding fraud are motivated by the demands of compliance regulations rather than a genuine desire to change the culture around corruption. Doing that requires a new attitude to the men and women who lift the lid on corruption in the first place. Cynthia Stimpel was group treasurer at South African Airways, a state-owned enterprise. In 2016, she discovered that the company was apparently planning to avoid due diligence procedures. Cynthia was asked to raise money to finance debts by paying a new company substantially over the amount charged by banks. I then said, well, I'm not prepared to sign it. I'm not prepared to approve it. We should go back to the banks. Let's get a different costing, and I'm sure we will save money. But it went ahead, and it was approved by board, despite my refusal to sign the documents. Cynthia blew the whistle on this highly irregular transaction. Well, at the time was firstly a determination that I need to do this and that it's the right thing to do for my own personal conscience, for my personal values, for my own moral compass. My name is Cynthia Agnes Soraya Stimple. When she testified at the Zondo Commission into Corruption, Cynthia hit the public eye as her actions had helped save taxpayers $17 million. But South African Airways wasn't so grateful. Cynthia lost her job. She has since joined forces with other whistleblowers who have suffered similar fates. Their message is clear. If companies are serious about installing an ethical culture, they need to reward whistleblowers, not punish them. Most of the people here held senior positions at major companies, all alleged fraud at those companies yet all ended up losing their jobs for blowing the whistle. I thought I would be protected because I followed everything to the T. Mm. But what the first thing that happened, I was called in and immediately suspended without even being able to speak. I wasn't able to give my side of the story. I still haven't had a hearing. The end result is that I've lost my job. Without whistleblowers, we wouldn't have the Zonda Commission. Everybody asks, but why are people not speaking up? But if you look at all the people that's gone to all these commissions, all of them have lost their jobs. So what does that teach you? Don't speak up because you'll lose your job. The culture in companies may be slow to change, but the increased visibility of whistleblowers is helping drive a broader shift in South Africans' collective will to challenge corruption. Do we accept the way it is, or do you stand up for something? I think the people around this table decided to stand up for something. We've got some of the key change makers that the globe has ever seen in our history. We have that fortitude, the resilience, we want to better South Africa. This determination of the few to make a stand is a vital step to tackling corruption. But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Seeing corrupt individuals or companies held to account may encourage others to think twice. New tools make it easier to expose wrongdoing in the first place. And together, they feed the momentum for change from the public, from business, and from those in power. That's the key to disrupting corruption.